cheaper for me to just slap this in and have it work than at his salary to spend the whole day trying to fix, you know, get Linux to work with this crazy video card that they had. Um, but he was always in these situations where, you know, he was trying to be nice, he was agreeing to help, and then you know, five hours later he was giving up. And his manager was getting calls that were complaints saying, you know, this guy's incompetent. He spent five hours and couldn't get this video card working. And the boss would say, well, which video card was it? And they would list some unsupported video card and he'd say, well, now I'm between a, a, a rock and a hard place because I'm, I'm getting a complaint about one of my staff, but the complaint is about something he wasn't supposed to be doing anyway. He's not supposed to help you with an unsupported practice card. So what could the boss do? So what the boss did was he told everyone, here's, you know, reminded everyone, here's the list of what's supported and what's not. If someone asks you to support an unsupported card, here's the policy. Tell the person, oh, this is unsupported. I can work on it. My boss lets me work on unsupported hardware for one hour, and that's it. And then I have to give up. And do this with your hands off the keyboard. And you sort of back off and get the user to understand, oh, okay, one hour. Then work for an hour and a half and give up if, mm. if you haven't succeeded. Okay. And like because the real Scotty policy principle. was you get 90 minutes of support and unsupported. But, but tell them an hour. Well, now he was getting calls from users, uh, the boss was getting calls saying, hey, you know, in, instead of <coughs> the guy couldn't get my graphics card to work, he was getting calls, and, and therefore is a bad person. He was getting calls saying, hey, I really want to thank you, you know, this one guy, I know he wasn't supposed to work on this graphics card, but, um, you know, he worked and he, he tried so hard and he had to give up, but, boy, what a great guy. Because <laughs> he worked a whole 90 minutes when he was only supposed to work an hour. <laughs> and that was better than the five hours that he used to spend. So, maybe that's, maybe that can be your policy. You can tell people, oh, that's not supported, I can help you for 15 minutes, but, you know, after that I'm going to have to give up. Then give him a half an hour. Okay. And then they'll, they'll think you're great instead of being a jerk. Okay, um, I think we're going to get started because it's we're five minutes late. And I know that you have a date back in town when you're, or a, a prior engagement after this. So everybody, if you haven't met him yet, Tom Lunicelli, he's going to help us out. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the group for inviting me and thanks for... Uh, for uh, bringing me here, and thanks for Google for paying for the gasoline. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Tom Lincelli. I uh, just started, I just changed jobs recently. I'm still actually training at Google. I work in the New York office, but the training is here in California, so it was, it was uh, serendipitous that uh, while I'm out here, I was able to speak at a number of user groups. Um, and Google's paying for my rental car, so I got the gas paid when I'm here. Um, so I'll be talking about time management for system administrators and, and everyone else. Who, who here is a system administrator or any kind of <laughs> technician? Excellent. And the people who didn't raise their hand, what kind of field are you in? Computer students. Yeah. Students. students, okay. Computers other than back? Um, application development. Application development, okay, excellent. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about uh, meeting with my boss, actually. Um, I said I'm new at Google. At my previous job, I was in uh, the New Jersey office and my boss was in Maryland, um, 400 miles apart. And meeting with my boss uh, was pretty difficult, even just by phone. Now, like most system administrator positions, there's often certain things that can't get done um, or are delayed if you, um, until you can talk to your boss. You need to talk to your boss for a decision or something. And so this was becoming a problem. I, I did a little you know, thinking, a little math, and realized that I was spending about an hour a week playing phone tag and instant message tag with my boss. An hour a week to get maybe a 15 minute meeting with my boss to get certain decisions made. So that doesn't sound very you know, efficient, an hour of, you know, crap to get a 15 minute meeting. So I made this deal with my boss. Every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m., whether we need, whether we think we have something to talk about or not, we were gonna call each other. Whether she was in the London office or in California, where if I was traveling or, or in the New Jersey office, um, 
9 a.m. East Coast time, Tuesday and Thursday, we were going to talk to each other. Um, and usually the phone calls were very quick. I got nothing, I got nothing, okay, click. And sometimes they you know, were longer. Um, and this saved me an hour a week. By turning something that was chaotic into something that was routine, I was able to save an hour a week. And my hope for this presentation, and, and hopefully the book also, is if I can find, if you think about it, that was an hour a week with one technique. If I can find seven more like it, that's, an, that's eight hours a week that I'm saving you. I'm, yeah, eight hours a week. Now, eight hours a week is two and a half work months a year. That's two and a half, you know, eight hour work days per year. So if you can just find eight things that work for you that save an hour at a time, that's like getting November and December and part of January of extra time at work. So that's a, that's a pretty good proposition. Um, and that's what this book is about. So let's cover some metadata. Um, who is this guy? I've been a uh, system administrator all my life. My you know, first words were the servers down. <laughs> um, and um, Unix since 1991. Um, I've worked at companies such as Google, Cybernet, Dean for America, the presidential campaign, uh, the Meta Bell Labs. Um, majority of my career was at at t Bell Labs slash Lucent as they kept you know, splitting and dividing the name. Um, and I've uh, co-authored the practice of system network administration with Christine Hogan, who is now Christine Lear. Um, and I have this new book out, Time Management from O'Reilly. Oh, by the way, if you just arrived, we have uh, discount coupons from O'Reilly if you pick them up at the meeting. So um, that's a little about me. I know a little about you, um, but I'd like to learn a little bit more. Uh, what is your biggest time management problem? Having users that just walk in your office and interrupt you while you're you know, in a train of thought working on a project. Right, so you're in the middle of a project and the user comes in and interrupts you. And, um, what else? Type support my email. Constantly having to check your email. No, somebody right. else is asking me for checking their email. Oh, someone else asking? Walking in while I'm doing something and then can I check my email real quick? Oh, oh someone wanted to use your computer for yeah. something else. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah. Wait. <clears throat> Doing duties that, too, that fall under too many different <coughs> job descriptions. Everything from script writing and sub development to you know remote network troubleshooting to assisting people with VPN and doing help desk and application support, as well as the uh, internal help desk. Right. So being you know, required in, 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 in remote and my biggest one out of all of those is probably going to be dealing with remote VPN users and what they do to their computer or not do. So having a job description which is asterisk. You know, all yes. of the above. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Jack Other duties as required. So being pulled in too many directions. Yes. And, um, probably uh, helping the same user fix the same problem because they forgot how to fix the problem. Ah, so repeat questions. Yes. You know, the user that every week asks how to underline in Microsoft Word. Yeah. The baby yes. club person. Yes. <coughs> user training. Hmm? User training. User training. Okay. Good. Forgotten yes. passwords. Uh, Forgotten users. passwords. And users constantly. User forgetting passwords. Okay, excellent. Um, good. Um, the first thing that was mentioned was users interrupting them. And that's, um, as I travel around and, and teach time management classes, I find that is the number one system administrator complaint. Users coming in, um, and what I found is uh, your users sort of rate you if you're a good or bad sysadmin uh, based on how accessible you are to them. You know, if you're always available, they love you. Um, but your boss determines your next uh, pay raise based on whether you get projects done. And you can't get projects done if you're always available. So these two things are um, sort of opposites. Um, and the, the other thing that uh, I hear the most often, which I heard today, was um, uh, trying to get uh, um, uh, trying to maintain focus. So, it, which is related to interrupts. So, you know, if, if I'm, you know, it takes me a good 10 minutes to get really into a project, and then when I get interrupted, if it's a two minute interruption, um, when I'm back from the interrupt, it takes me another 10 minutes to get really back into, into focus. So actually a two minute interrupt really has more like a 
15 minute cost. So like you're, you know, traveling backwards in time, you know. Um, so if you go into uh, Borders Bookstore, there's a whole big section of uh, self-help books and uh, there's a whole shelf of that section that's just time management books. So why do system administrators and technical people need a time management book just for us? Well, our problems are different. We have a higher degree of interrupts, and yet we're still expected to get projects done. And these two things are opposite. Also, our solutions are different. We're geeks. We can handle more technical solutions to things. Um, though this book is not like you know 101 things to do with the PDA. Um, in fact, I don't really give any like, now click this, now click this, now click this kind of instructions in the book. Because I figure system administrators don't need to be told what's in the manual. Um, this isn't, um, you know, uh, O'Reilly has this line of, you know, the secrets book, you know, Microsoft Word secrets and, um, you know, a good, you know, I don't think, you know, the fact that you can press control W or control U to underline is, is a Microsoft Word secret. I, I think a good Microsoft secret would be like, you know, the guy who wrote the spell checker was, was cheating on his wife. That would be, <laughs> that would be the, the Microsoft Word secrets book that I want to read. Oh, oh that was crashing. <laughs> yeah. um, so the solutions are different. We, we use different tools. But also, there's a lack of mentoring. You know, if you have an MBA, if you're a business guy and your boss is a business guy and you need mentoring on time management, you can talk with your boss and get good feedback. But if you're a system administrator, if your boss is technical, they're just as screwed up in time management as you are. So you really can't ask for any advice. And if your boss is non-technical, they have no idea what you're doing. So they can't really give you any advice. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, we just don't have the kind of mentoring that other careers have as far as time management. But then there's another reason why I wrote the book, which is um, I finally came up with a reason to um, license cartoons from userfriendly.org, um, which I knew I could do if I was writing on time management. So in the book, you'll find every chapter has a has an appropriate cartoon from, from the user-friendly comic strip, which if you're a system administrator and you're not reading user-friendly, I, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's like Dilbert, but more technical. <laughs> OK. So the book has 13 chapters. Um, the first third is sort of the principles and the rudiments of time management. The middle four uh, chapters are on the cycle system, which is my sort of system for maintaining your, your to-do list, your calendar, and your long-term and, and life goals. Um, and the last third is about uh, spot issues, email management, eliminating time wasters, documentation, and automation, that kind of thing. So, there's other time management books out there, but none of them will have a chapter with all, with you know my favorite shell scripting tip, tricks or how to automate Windows tasks. You, know, you won't find that in Getting Things Done. I pick on Getting Things Done, but I love the book. Um, he really covers the psychology of time management, which is something I can't possibly cover. But unlike Covey's books or Getting Things Done or these other books, um, I think the time management techniques I talk about are very lightweight. You can just do the parts of the cycle that are useful to you as opposed to, I think, Getting Things Done, which is a fantastic book, but it's like uh, you're joining the, re the, getting the GTD religion. You, know, you give your life over to using the Getting Things Done techniques, um, which is, is cool, but as sysadmins, I think we want to you know, give ourselves over to Stallman first. Um, so, <laughs> boo, boo, bad example. Okay, so some basic principles. Um, in the book, uh, we try to use one system uh, for all of our time management stuff. So whether you use a, an, all the techniques work, whether you use a PDA, a personal digital assistant, or a PAA, a personal analog assistant. So this is my PAA. I can turn the bookmark to today and see that I'm speaking at this group. Hey, pretty cool. Um, and even has a list of things I shouldn't forget to, uh, to bring with me today. So, um, uh, so one system, one, one place to put your to-do list, your calendar, your long-term and life goals. Um, we're going to conserve brain power um, by writing things down instead of trying to keep them in our brain. 
Now I know as system administrators, we're usually hired for our brain. We're pretty proud of what our brain can do. We're usually not hired for our good looks. We're hired for our brains, and that's okay. Um, but if your brain is trying to focus on you know, installing a new web server and trying to remember that you have a meeting at two o'clock and you have to pick up bread on the way home from work, that's two additional things in your brain that are distracting you from getting that web server installed. So instead we're gonna put those reminders in our PDA or PAA to free up our brain so we can focus better. Um, we're gonna use routines, like what I mentioned before with my uh, meeting with my boss. Um, and we're gonna use the same tools everywhere. So I use my uh, PDA or PAA um, to track my work life and my social life um, so that I don't have, uh, so there's less of a chance of conflict, so I don't agree to work late and then realize, oh, if I had checked my personal calendar, I would have seen that I was a surprise party to go to that night. Um, so actually, we're gonna have more fun because we're managing our, better, our, our time better. So we're not you know, realizing too late that we missed the surprise party. Um, we're, we're going to the surprise party. Um, and also by using one system for our sort of work life and non-work life, we're getting more practice at it. Um, time management is, um, is difficult. It's a, it's a habit to develop. And habits, if anyone's ever you know, tried to you know, quit smoking or take up jogging or, or any kind of habit that you want to develop, you know that it takes a while before it becomes natural. The more practice, um, the, the faster the habit gets developed. So by using it in all parts of our life, we um, develop the habit quicker because we're getting more practice. So uh, maintaining focus. Um, so people said, you know, the, the number one time management problem for system administrators is, is dealing with interrupts. Um, so how can we maintain focus? Um, a system administrator's life is divided between putting out fires and building new buildings. Um, and what is focus? Focus is concentrated effort. Like I said before, if we're installing a new web server, but also have 15 other things to think about, we're not as focused as we could be. So there are focus problems that we, that we cause ourselves, and focus problems that come from the outside world. Um, focus problems we cause come from all sorts of different places. Having a messy desk, studies have shown, you know, it's difficult to focus when you have lots of visual things. Um, and visually complex things around us. When we have you know, icons on our desktop, our instant messenger clients are clienting, and you know, music, and clock tickers, and news tickers, and, and stock tickers, and games, and um, all that kind of thing going on. So one of the things we can do to help maintain focus is shut down that stock ticker application. Only run your instant message client when, um, when we're in, you know, during certain times of the day, you know, not when we're working on a, a project, not during our project time, but yes, during our you know, communication time, that kind of thing. Um, but then there's the external um, interrupts, the person walking to, into our office. And the book has a whole chapter about uh, techniques for dealing with, with the stopping, the person <coughs> that just walks in in the middle of the day. But let me give you the, the the one tip that's going to save you the most amount of time. It's called the mutual interruption shield. So if you have a coworker, make this pact with them. In the morning, if someone tries to you know, come in the door, call you or whatever, you'll take all the interrupts and let them work on projects. You'll be the shield, the interruption shield for them in the morning and they can get projects done. And then in the afternoon, you swap and they take all the interrupts and and you take, uh, and, and then that becomes your project time. Or, you know, split the day however you want. Um, uh, is this something that, you know, it sounds like something that's doable for in your work environment? What yes. do you do with, if you have, you're the only sysadmin? Excellent question. So what, what can you do if you're a solo sysadmin? Um, what you can do in that case is um, uh, talk with your management about you know, is there some kind of arrangement can, that we can get? Is um, uh, maybe you could at least, you know, affect, you know, notify users that it's preferred that you come with interrupts in the afternoon, <coughs> or at least. Uh, actually, we'll talk about a couple of techniques um, 
that we can do in a couple slides. Um, good question. Uh, so if you're, um, you can change the official structure of your group. Um, uh, let me go in the other direction first. What if you're in a large group? I was once in a group that had um, 15 sysadmins on a team. We had a very large user, group, user base, 15 sysadmins. Um, we were able to give, um, actually, I think we did 12 hours of coverage a day, 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and so each person had one hour a day where they were the interruption and everyone else was able to work on projects. Um, or you, uh, another arrangement is to set up a tier one. Start hiring people whose job it is to do nothing but handle those interests. So if you're in a large environment, you could have um, a tier one person, someone who's, you know, maybe you've hired them, they don't have the best technical skills, but they're a friendly, personable person, and they're gonna be the interrupt checker, uh, uh, shield all the time. They're gonna be that customer-facing person. And when someone asks for something that's more of a long-term request, that gets bumped to tier two, which is doing you know, projects and engineering. And if you can't get management buy-in, at least you can do maybe you know, unofficial things. You know, is your physical layout such that people have to walk past your coworkers before they get to you? They're more likely to interrupt you know, someone that's closer. Um, or can you just be, or can you arrange it so that tier one people are in offices that are in high traffic areas and the senior people, the tier two people are sort of obscured from being the visually there. In the closets. Yeah. In the closets, so to speak, yes. I have no windows at work. Um, now, if you're the, a solo assistant, then, um, uh, well, actually, I'm going to talk about that under uh, dealing with interrupts. So. So a lot of the time management tips are sort of under the category of uh, the ebb and flow of business. So one example of that is my, what I call the first hour rule. Your first hour of the day often has the least amount of interrupts because that's the hour that everyone's standing around the water cooler talking or getting their coffee or whatever. So uh, it might not be the first hour of the day at your company, it might be you know, midday, um, but if I, I find that if I can come into work an hour earlier than um, the rest of my team, in that first hour I can get so much done. And I used to squander that time. I used to use that time to get caught up with email, which, um, if you think about, it, isn't the most important thing. I was, I was using it to get, get caught up on email, even though I was complaining that I wasn't getting projects done. So instead. Uh, I learned when I come in, I should maybe look at the subject lines of my emails, make sure there isn't anything really urgent, but then close my email reader and spend that first hour of the day working on a project. Um, especially if I come in an hour earlier than, like, well, so if you have flex time, that means you know, actually coming in at 9 a.m. Um, you know, I'm not talking about coming in at 5 in the morning to get uh, more work done. Um, but let's see. Um, then there's other other business issues like um, maybe your maybe your business has a, a seasonal aspect to it. If you um, maybe the the summertime is a slower time for your business, so that's a good time to plan the major upgrades. Um, maybe spring is your busy time, so that's when you want to plan. Maybe it's the company's busy time, so that's the time of the year where you're not allowed to make a lot of changes to the network. So it's actually better to schedule your vacations then um, and just keep around a skeleton crew versus having, um, you know, because you know you're not going to be able to make a lot of you know, big changes. Or, um, I have friends that work at Amazon.com and they all take their vacation in January because, you know, December is where they're making like a big portion of their yearly sales. So they all have to be on staff in case anything goes wrong. But they all know that in January, after the, all the returns are processed, um, the IT group can basically disappear, um, leaving a skeleton group. So if you can plan your work cycle around the, the, the company's work cycle, there's benefits. Um, when I was at my last company, they had no cycle. Everything was crazy. They had software releases whenever they thought they could. And I actually worked with the development management to say, hey, how about we have a release every two months and we can plan a cycle around this. 
Um, which means, uh, you know, the, in this two-month cycle, there'll be a time when the, the uh, architects are busy, a time where the developers are busy, a time where QA is busy, <coughs> and a time where I'm busy deploying software. And we'll just have this two-month cycle, and then everyone can plan their vacations around it. QA can take a vacation in the beginning, but not at the end. And developers in the middle, but not, you know, you can figure out your own examples. Um, and because of that, everyone was able to plan around them. And then marketing realized, hey, if we're going to plan things in a two-week cycle, a two-month cycle, we can even plan the marketing around them because we now know when the new features are going to be released. And the whole company now was sort of working on this two-month cycle, and it, and it helped everyone. Um, but most importantly, I was able to plan my vacations. <laughs> so tip number four, handle interrupts without being a jerk. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, sysadmins ruling with, not, not ruling with fear, but being the nice guys. Um, I think it helps around budget time the most. Who <laughs> wants to give money to the nice guys? Uh, like men and women. Um, so, how do you handle an interrupt without being a jerk? Rather than moaning, oh, another person, or, or doing, yes, I'll do it exactly right now. Um, you know, both of those have their downsides. So when I get an interrupt, I pause and sort of settle myself and say, okay, which am I going to do? Am I going to record it, delegate it, or do it? So someone comes in and says, um, well, so when would we record it? We would record it if we're in the middle of another project and it's not urgent and it's not one of those requests that they're going to stand there until it's done. So for example, someone says, we need a new, Thursday, we're going to need a new PC in someone's office. Okay, I write it down, or I put it in my PDA, or I open a ticket, and I say, thank you. And then I give them the, now get out of my office. <laughs> um, the important thing about this is, instead of just saying, go away, you've acknowledged their request. People, there's like this sort of scale of what people prefer. People would... Optimally, they'd like everything to be done immediately when they request it. But they know that the laws of physics can't be broken by systems. They know that you know, if you say order the software package, even if you use overnight shipping, it's going to take 24 hours to get the software package. Or maybe you're fast, but they know the purchase, purchasing department is slow. And, um, so it's going to take a couple days to receive something. So they know that op what they prefer, you know, everything being done immediately, isn't going to happen. But the second best thing is that you've acknowledged their request. And it's amazing, the psychology is amazing. That if someone feels like they've been listened to, they are 90% happy. And we can't make people 100% happy all the time. So if you can just acknowledge, and not just, yeah, 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 I'll do it. That's not acknowledgement. If you write it down, they feel like you've given them a warm hug. It's like, oh, wow, he wrote it down. I'm important. Um, so step one, can I record it? If I, if I can, I take that much. <coughs> Or delegate. Um, if I've set up a mutual interrupt shield, then I can delegate. Oh, you know, Bob's handling that kind of thing this morning. Please talk to Bob. Or if it's a technical request and the person was struggling just making the request, it can be useful to call Bob and translate it, you know, so that they don't have to you know, repeat the request. Um, now you've, you've delegated it and you can close the issue. You might want to record in your PDA that you delegated it if you feel like you should follow up to make sure it actually happened or just trust that Bob's going to do it. Yes? Where would you put, would you put it under recorded or delegate to where, um, I do this a lot with my users. We have a help ticket system where they can just submit via email to RT. And I say, oh, okay, that's a great idea. Can you make an RT for it? And sure. just send it. And that, a lot of times, the effect for that is just as good as me writing it down, and I don't have to remember where I wrote it down. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big proponent of using some kind of uh, like database-driven help desk tool, like uh, I think uh, Support It or RT. I'm a big fan of RT because it's open source. Um, on a Linux <coughs> box or FreeBSD box, you can have it up and running in an afternoon. Um, who here uses, or who here, yeah, uses some kind of trouble ticketing system with the users. Oh, okay, not a lot of hands. Let me recommend that as the first thing you should do when you get back to work on Monday. Um, uh, 
uh, the ability to tell someone, um, you know, let's say, yeah, most places I work, if you send email to help, it automatically generates a ticket, or you could go to the web interface to create a ticket there. So the ability to tell someone, instead of, go away, I'm busy, instead to be able to say, hey, could you file a ticket, or you know, could you send email to help? You know, when someone passes you in the hallway and say, hey, can you set up a new machine? If you can respond, if you respond, yeah, I'll try to remember that and then forget. You're going to look bad when you forget. But if you can say, hey, send an email to help and I'll, I'll get right on that, then you look like the good guy. And it helps you manage your time better because you can look at those tickets, prioritize them, um, and do a better job of, of managing your time instead of them managing your time for you by coming in and interrupting. So, um, Especially if you're the solo system in the RT system, the RT system becomes like your your personal assistant that's tracking what you're doing. Um, okay, so delegate sort of del this is sort of delegating to RT because you're you're recording it. Actually, it's more like recording. You you've created a ticket. Okay, and then your third choice is do it. I mean, sometimes you just have to do it. Even if you're in a project, um, what someone is reporting to you is an emergency. Or maybe it's your specific job to react to that kind of situation. Um, if a request is going to take less than two minutes, um, then I, I find it's faster to do it than record it and do it later. Um, also, if it's something like a password reset, um, the, uh, I find a password reset isn't important because someone needs their password reset. Password, is re password reset is important because it's delaying a bigger project. I mean, the person doesn't care about logging in, they care about printing out the document. <coughs> so if you hold off on resetting a password until you know, the afternoon or whatever, you've delayed someone a whole half a day before they can print or whatever they're trying to do. So uh, those kind of things, uh, sort of tasks with a domino effect, um, have a ur more urgent priority in, in my sort of head than scheduling these kind of things. And then finally, requests from my boss always interrupt projects. You know, because if your boss comes and says, how many, you know, we want to upgrade all the machines to a gig of RAM. Can you find out how many machines don't have a gig of RAM? Um, if you do that two weeks from now, do you know how annoying that is to your boss? Because your boss isn't going to do the upgrades. Your boss is just trying to write the budget. And wouldn't it be terrible if your boss is talking to his boss saying, well, my budget is going to be late because I haven't gotten estimates yet from Tom. You don't want to be the guy or the woman delaying your boss's projects. Your, your boss is like the ultimate domino effect. You know, everything he needs is really delaying some bigger kind of project. So if your boss says, you know, count the number of ceiling tiles we have, I say, I'll be right on that, sir. And even if you can just get an estimate, well, I did a, some math and I think we have 1,000, but if you want a specific answer, I'll have to come back to you. Usually your boss says, oh, that's fine. I just, I just needed to know how many ceiling tiles we have because it's a budget thing. And an estimate's good enough. Um, so the other reason that requests from my boss get immediate priority is because, can anyone guess? He signs your check. He signs my paycheck, right. <laughs> because when they're doing salary reviews, I don't want him to be thinking, Tom took me two weeks to get that count of ceiling tiles when all I needed was an estimate. <laughs> so, um, Absolutely. <laughs> right. You won. Um, <coughs> so any, any questions before I go into second five? It's stopping Just that by coming one hour earlier, you blew your savings up for eight hours, two and a half months for the year. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, actually, you know, people say, oh, I, love, I have flex time. I, I can work any 80 hours a week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> remember in, in the 50s or all those movies you know in the future we will have you know robots will do our work for us and we will have 20 hour work weeks they always said you know by the year 2000 we'll have a 20 hour work week but instead we work 60 hours and half of our friends are unemployed you know <laughs> which averages to 20 hours hey they were right <laughs> amazing um yeah i i always i like to remind people i'm not a morning person but Flex time does mean you can come in earlier. Um, and I find that, uh, yeah, that first hour can, can be a windfall. And then, um, and then I can leave 
or at least you know, negotiate to leave an hour earlier um, and get to my you know, social things afterward. Other question? Is there a hand in back? Well, I'm just going to say that the last hour today is probably the worst one because you're all tired. Uh, if I walk into the problem a half hour before it's quick time and it's not learned, it's not earth shaking, I find it like the worst, my worst work gets done then. And back, uh, back to your first hour is the best one. <coughs> For some reason, the next morning after a good night's sleep, I'll come in in 15 minutes, I got the problem fixed. Right, excellent point. And, and a lot of times, problems can be fixed better by you know, sleeping on it. You know, you wake up and you have the, the, a better answer. Um, yeah, I find, so in the morning, I can do brain work, like, so much better than the afternoon when I, the fatigue is set in. But I, if I have physical work to do, like lifting a, a machine to put it into a rack, 3 o'clock, I always try to put those things around 3 o'clock. I can, I just, because I can't think well at 3 o'clock, but at least I can lift things. <laughs> that's, that's implying I can think well any time of the day. <laughs> so, uh, oh, thank you. I mentioned water and it appears. <laughs> what a great place for us. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about classifying tasks before optimizing them. Um, I, uh, one of the things that helped me the most about writing this book was that I had an opportunity to mentor a junior assistant. And it really forced me to think out all these you know, little bits of advice I was, I was giving as a junior assistant. And one thing I noticed is um, uh, he was often picking the wrong tool for the, for the situation. And I realized that a lot of that is, is classifying what's the right kind of tool for what we're doing right now. So sysadmins really do four different <coughs> things. We do, there are simple things that we do rarely and hard things that we do rarely. And there's simple things we do a lot and hard things that we do a lot. So if you think of every kind of task that a sysadmin can do in these four categories, you can actually put it in a grid like this. You can say, so we have items that are you know, from rare to often and easy to hard. Um, and so if something's in that first category, it's rare, but it's really easy to do. What kind of techniques can we apply to tasks like that? Cron. Or Well, it's rare. So actually, that's, that's the category where we can do things manually. You know, it wouldn't make sense to automate something that happens, you know, every couple months or now and then, because you, you'd spend a day automating it, and then you know, we're not going to use the program. There isn't a lot of, as the business people say, a lot of return on investment. Um, but it's easy, so it doesn't matter. You know, it's easy. We can do it. We can do it manually, and that doesn't matter. But if it's if it happens rare and it's really difficult to do, then then what can we do in this category? Automate. Well, we can automate it, but it's happening so rarely enough, we're not really going to have that return on investment. You can document it. You can document it, exactly. So I have this RAID disk system, so we can document uh, At my last time, we had uh, a RAID disk system, and to replace a disk, it was the most complicated thing. And it, it was like you, you type a command, you you know, you rub your belly while pulling out the disk, and then there's another command, and or maybe there isn't a command after you pull it, but when you replace the new disk, um, anyway. So the the first time it happened, we had to go through the manual and figure out what we did, and then um, and we had the, the brilliant idea of documenting this because um, it's going to happen rarely, and you can't automate. Also, you can't automate it because how can you automate taking a disk out of the box and putting it in? Pearl doesn't have that module yet. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah. they're working on it. I'm sure they're working on it. And yeah, I'm sure that, who's the guy? Andy Lester, the, the guy who, he writes all these QA tools for automating, you know, things. He, he did the Pearl, Pearl Mechanize module, oh. which lets you pretend to be a web, a person surfing the web so you can write a script that would you fill, know, out forms fill out forms and stuff to test your, uh, your CGI scripts. So we documented it so that the next time it happens, um, we can just review that. We don't have to find where in the manual it says. And sometimes, you know, documentation is this big, scary word. It doesn't need to be scary. What if you just type, once you got the command right, you just cut and paste, you know, your terminal session, 
into a document, and that's your documentation. You know, it's sloppy, but it's, it's enough to jog your memory the next time that happens. And if someone complains, um, you could say, well, you have access. You could update the document, make it cleaner. Um, so you can document things. Now, what about this next category? If it's easy and it happens often, that's, that's, a problem. That, that's when you want to automate, absolutely. Um, this is the automation quadrant. So automation comes in big chunks and small chunks. Um, I find that I might have a thousand computers on my network, but I'm always typing the host name of two. I mean, there's two machines that I, I type those host names the most. So I've set up aliases in you know Bash on my Unix systems. I have um, an alias where I just type the first two letters of the host name, and that's SSH to the, the host name. Um, and you can set up, you know, applications often have an aliasing mechanism. Um, so the most frequently typed commands, you can set up an alias. Or I, I'm big on SSH aliases. So when I type, you know, in rsync or SSH or SCP, if I type a certain host name, um, SSH is configured to know, well, for that host, we do this level of compression, you know, this encryption method, this key, et cetera. So, um, and, and the, so actually, so the, my web server is uh, everythingsysadmin.com, so ES, everything sysadmin. Um, if I type ES on the command line, it's a shell alias that SSHs to that machine. If I type it as part of a command, it's a SSH alias. So if I'm using you know, SCP or, or RSync or whatever, um, ES is all I have to type to get you know, everythingsysadmin.com. Um, and um, you can set up DNS aliases. So in the small version of Automate is you know, setting up aliases and that kind of thing. And the big version of, of automating, obviously you can learn Perl or Ruby or Python. All, or in the Microsoft world, there's um, various automation tools. Um, so you can automate things and, and have some kind of payback because it's happening often. Now what about this last category? It happens a lot. But it's really hard. It's beyond what you could personally automate. Hire an intern. What? Hire an intern. Hire an intern. <laughs> OK. Hire an intern or? Worker money. I used to. Hmm? Delegate. Or delegate. delegate. <laughs> um, or what else? Who can you delegate it to? You know what? Uh, if you have like a program. Outsource it. <clears throat> if you have a program, outsource. Right. So this is, this is the purchase category. Um, this is where either you can either purchase or, or really procure, because it might be a, an open source package. Um, and the, the benefit of this, using um, a commercial, you know, off the shelf or, or open source packages, is they've done most of the work for you, and now you, as the system administrator, become more of a system integrator. You're integrating these different packages and getting them to work together. And I think that's often where. We as system administrators are the best. We're the best at integrating things. If you learn enough shell programming, you can make you know your accounting system talk to the water faucets and control the bank. <laughs> you know that's the kind of integration that we are as system administrators are, are good at. So I used to think backups were in this category. They're easy and they happen often. You know they happen every day, right? So you write a shell script that it's like five dump commands and it does your backups. And then you get really fancy, you put it in a loop, so it's four, five different machines, and, you know, and, then, it, and then you buy a, a, a tape library, and then you change tape technology, and this, and, and actually, and then you realize, oh, backups is really hard, and happens every day. Um, and that's why it's better to install Bacula, or Amanda, um, because they've done the hard work for you, and every time there's a new, uh, Instead of you figuring out how to control a new kind of tape drive, um, you know, someone else has figured it out, and their efforts have um, this multiply effect because they figured it out once, and everyone's using the software. So the uh, the cost of that new development is amortized over many users, and then you can focus on the um, uh, on the integration. And there's one category that's not on this chart, which is hard and happens exactly once, which is definitely where you want to pay someone else to do it. So I once spent, actually, 
Thank God it wasn't me. Someone on my team went and spent six months trying to get Legato Networker to work. Um, and then they really felt like they were an expert in installing Legato Networker, which they will never have to do again because once it's installed, it's running. So it would have been much more effective to pay the ten million dollars that they charged, well, like the twenty grand that they would have charged to do the installation for us, and then, um, and then they would have taught us. Okay, we did the hard part. We did the installation, which you're never going to have to do again. So it wasn't worth learning. But now here's how to add a new machine, delete a new machine. Here's what to do when a tape, when a new disk is um, installed and you know, how to do a, a restore. You know, those four, those kind of daily operational things, they can teach you. And it's worth the, the 10 or 20 grand to pay um, someone to do that initial installation. Um, and you think, well, in six months of salary, sure, that's you know, hopefully less than, or you know, maybe, that's, maybe that is six months of salary. But the benefit is you got it in two weeks instead of six months. And you, as the system administrator, were able to do other things during those six months than fret over you know, this installation, which I pick on Legato, but you know, it's only because it's a crappy product. Um, <laughs> and they're the only one out there. Um, but uh, back to it. I'm trying to learn back to it. It's very nice. And free, open source. Um, so here's, here's the, uh, the categorization group. Any, any questions on this section? Yes. Yeah, earlier said he, had, he was a solo assistant and he's got problems with people calling up all the time for uh, password changes. Mm -hmm. Where would that fit into this and how could you address it? Um, I think resetting someone's password is easy to do and so it's a matter of is it happening often or yeah, and he was saying it's happening often so it might be worthwhile to automate it. Um, there are self-serve password reset mechanisms that like, uh, like Yahoo wouldn't be able to survive if they didn't have the click on for I forgot my password and emails to you know, email some cookie to some other uh, site. Maybe there's a way you could set up um, uh, a self-serve system or maybe the company receptionist could be trained to reset passwords. Give her a, or him or her a, a web page that maybe only she can use that lets her do resets. And so now it's, it's sort of automated, or you've automated it enough so that a trusted party can do the password resets. Um, uh, another useful thing about automations, you can keep statistics. Um, so you can, you can actually count and go to your boss and say, I reset 500 passwords this week at five minutes each. It's amazing I got anything else done. It, wouldn't it be worthwhile to automate it or give it to the receptionist or or Johnny's a retard. You or have to retrain him every time he sleeps. Right. <laughs> or, or actually, some, the best person to do password resets is someone in HR, because in theory they know how to prove that someone really is who they say they are. Um, the, the thing about uh, collecting statistics also is you can you can tell um, if maybe the maybe it's 499 times a week is is Johnny. Um, and it's one time a week from someone else. So maybe Johnny's the problem when we need to fix that. Um, when, when I was at Bell Labs, my boss um, had this brilliant idea. He said, look at the tickets. You know, people try to do statistics on, on RT or whatever trouble tracking system they have, and they, they try to get really sophisticated. Well, if we knew how long each ticket took to close, and defining that is difficult enough, and they and they get bogged down in all these statistical problems and they end up not actually generating statistics. So my boss said, well, let's assume all tickets take the same amount of time. Who's generating the most tickets? And we found that three people were generating 10% of all tickets in the system. That's huge. So the, his question became, who are generating, who are, who are the most frequent 10% requesters? And it turned out three people were making the most requests. And we found that one of them, um, so, so that gave him something to work with. He, he talked to the systems that handled those tickets and found one person was constantly asking questions because the fundamental problem there was they were using an old version of software that we didn't support anymore. And all of their questions had to do with how can I fake out the old software to do the new features? And so we were able to get rid of that whole raft of 
problems by forcing them to upgrade or by giving that system, having the manager go to him and say, Bob, we're not supporting that anymore. We have it for a year. I'm giving Joe permission to say no whenever you ask. Would you like Joe to upgrade you? <laughs> um, actually, we did it more politically. We, we, went to the, we went to the person's boss and said, what do we have to do to get, you, to get this person that works for you to upgrade to new software? And he said, I've heard they have wireless mouses now. And we said, you will have the what finest color? wireless mouse. <laughs> what, color would you what color would you like? <laughs> And my boss, who had a wireless mouse, said, here, <laughs> take mine. <laughs> so that was person number one. Person number two was, um, it was a training thing. We said, okay, you know, we will put this person through training so they stop asking those questions. I don't remember what person number three was. But that eliminated one out of ten tickets by doing that kind of very simple analysis. After years of trying to do this complicated statistics with, based on how, you know, what's the longest ticket in the... We just said, look, what's, who's generating the, ten, or the, the top 10 most frequent posters? OK, any other questions on this? So turning chaos into routines, tip number six. Hopefully, so I mentioned before saving an hour a week by doing that, that routine with my boss. I'm always seeing advertisements that say, uh, you know, get out of that old boring routine. <laughs> I would like to get into that old boring routine. <laughs> I'm a sysadmin. I want one boring day. You know, one boring day when you know the manual is correct, the servers stay up, everything just works. That would be the perfect boring day. And then I'd be able to work on my projects, right? And because projects are exciting, right? Um, you get to play with the newest hardware, the newest software. That's I want lots of things to become boring so I can work on the exciting things. Um, you younger kids in the 70s, there's this band called The Police. Um, and they have a song, I wish I never woke up this morning. Life was easy when it was born. Yeah. Look, yeah. <laughs> younger kid, it's in Wikipedia. You'll look it up. There's this guy named Sting. He was the lead singer. He, he's still doing stuff. Copeland's doing soundtracks. Anyway. Um, so, um, so what can we turn? What exciting, chaotic things can we turn into nice, boring things? Um, so key meetings that are the same time every week. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, oh, the gasoline? Yeah, I, I like so that. So I refill my gas tank every Sunday. Um, I used to not do this, and every Monday, not only would I be late to work, but I'd also have an empty gas tank and be like, uh, well, I think I can make it. Oh, uh, no. And, and then I'd you know, turn into a gas station and be 10 minutes later because I have to get gas. So I just started always filling my tank, my gas tank on Sundays. Um, and as a result, I had this knock-on effect that I always tended to be out of gas every Wednesday. So I would just was always, you know, if I had something social after work on Wednesday, I knew I had to give an extra 10 minutes to, to fill up on gas. Um, and I started doing this so regularly that I forgot why I was doing it. I just knew I always get my gas tank filled on Sunday. Um, and in my last job, I actually walked to work and I needed gas like once a month. <laughs> but on Sunday, I would always, oh, it's, I can't remember why, but Sunday I need to check my gas. Okay, I'm good. Um, Go over to the sink, wash your hands, get gas. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, that's when you know a habit has been really, really good because you're just doing it um, without even thinking about it. Just, oh, it's Sunday, gas, good. Um, so less brain work, right? Less brain work about gas, be and that means more brain work for the projects, things I want to work on. And another routine I have is that at the beginning of every day, I spend five minutes planning my day. We're going to talk more about that under the cycle system. But um, you can develop your own routines. Think about any kind of repeated event that isn't scheduled. Or when procrastinating takes longer than doing it, <laughs> um, uh, things you forget often. So anytime you're in front of a user saying, I'm sorry, sir, I forgot, try to think, is there a routine I could have used that would make me not have to remember this? Because I'm just always, you know, getting it on Sunday. Um, any kind of low priority task that can be skipped now but shouldn't be. Like, you know, if the backups fail once, it's okay. I can I can skip that. Or actually a better better example is we had this cooling problem. 
Uh, so we had to bring in one of these, uh, we rented a temporary uh, chilling unit uh, to cool this sort of room with a, a bunch of electronic equipment. And it had a, a bucket that caught all the water from the condenser. And the bucket had to be emptied about every other day. And so every time I walked by it, I could always reasonably say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll empty it next time. <laughs> And you know, then I'd come back and say, oh, there's an inch. Yeah, I can empty it next time. And then I'd come by and I'd say, oh, I'll get a mop and clean up the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided, OK, this, this, is, this is where I need to set up a routine. So I just said, OK, no matter how much I can rationalize skipping it, first thing, well, you know, early in the morning, every day, I'm just going to empty it. I'm going to empty it whether I think it needs it or not, because that will reduce the number of times I need the mop. Um, uh, and any kind of maintenance task like that. You know, IT is a lot like gardening. Gardening, you do a little bit of work all throughout the year, and then you have the big payoff at harvest time. You can't just ignore your garden all year and then just have this marathon weekend of gardening uh, late in August and, and have you know, a harvest come. So uh, you want to develop a routine about it. You, know, you, you weed every Saturday morning, and it gets into a habit. Um, and so relationships are a lot like that. So when I was at Bell Labs, we are a large IT team. We had five different customer groups. And some of them liked us more than others. So we had screwed up big for one of the customer groups. They liked us the least. So we had to rebuild that relationship. And we couldn't do a marathon gardening weekend and have a good harvest. So we had to decide, OK, every Monday, I'm going to happen to wander by that group and just sort of hang out. How's it going? Do you need anything? And develop that relationship. And garden throughout the year and rebuild that relationship. So I tease a lot like gardening. Now, so routines are periodic. They're like things you can put in Chrome every Monday, every Sunday, every you know, one at 1 PM. So routines are periodic. And habits are situational. So habits are, every time I'm in this situation, I'm going to do something. So I, a lot of my career has been saved by this habit. I hesitate before I press enter. It's a good habit to get into. <laughs> um, you, know, you, you hesitate, you read the line, and you, make, you, know, you find that you prevent many problems. Um, I used to disconnect a server and figure, yeah, I probably got the right one. And then I improved it. I would disconnect it and ping it and make sure it didn't ping. And that, oh, OK, now I know I'm getting the right machine. Well, you know, what if you're not typing the right IP address or anything? So then I developed the habit of I ping, then I disconnect, then I ping again. Um, and it saved me many problems. I also don't retype the ping command. I use you know, cursor up or some kind of command line editing to repeat the exact same command. Um, so it should ping before and it shouldn't ping after, very important. When I change, uh, make changes on my firewall, you know, if I'm going to block port 80, I make sure I can get on port 80, then I make the change, then I make sure I can't. Um, I was doing this big firewall change and um, I didn't do that. Uh, and we, we moved, we were moving a web server from one, one IP address to another, and when we moved it, I couldn't ping it. I was like, oh no, we screwed up. And I, the real problem was I should have pinged before I changed the firewall rule because I forgot we had set up that machine to not be pingable. Um, <laughs> so we spent an hour debugging a problem that didn't exist because I, I didn't test before and after. Um, backing up a file, always back up a file. How many people have been in this situation? I'm making a small change to this configuration file. If I screw it up, I'll be able to undo it manually. Right? <laughs> Yeah, everyone makes that mistake. So I, I use RCS, guys. Right. I can't re recommend it enough. Yeah, um, RCS. There's a, a section in RCS, uh, section in the book that teaches you how to use RCS. RCS lets you essentially take snapshots of files, and it's very easy to just. Um, oh, I'm about to edit this file. It's ci-l file name, and you make a snapshot, so you can just roll back. You know, what was this file like last January on the 14th, and you can see what the file was like at that point. So when you do make a, um, uh, make a mistake, you have those backups. Um, and also other habits. You know, I, um, 
when I leave a computer room that has a, a card key to get in, I make sure the card key's in my hand before I, I leave. Um, I don't close, I don't lock my car door unless I feel my keys in my pocket. Um, you know, similar, similar things like that. So, routines are periodic, habits are situational, and automatic yes answers are just things that I've learned from life. And, and we all have things like this. Like, would this be a good time to save my work? You yes! Can, the answer is yes! Anytime I think, should I save my work? I just, you know, control S, no more thinking, you know, save your brain for, for your project. Um, so if you have to ask, the answer is yes. Should I bring, bring my PDA with me? Yes. Because if I don't bring this with me, that would be the one time the supermodel asks me on a date. And I'll say, I, I don't have my calendar with me, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, or, you know, it's true. I would rip that page out of my <laughs> Could you I'm free. anything more? <laughs> I'm Sorry, I'm having dinner with my mom that <laughs> yeah. night, so I'll have to cancel with you because I don't want to upset my mom. Um, and should I call? Okay, this is sort of obviously in the age of cell phones, but um, should you call if you're going to be late? Absolutely. It's just rude not to call. I find that, so I used to get really hung up, like, oh, I'm late, and uh, oh, but if I call, it's sort of like admitting that I'm late, so I'll just show up and pretend that you know, <laughs> if you call, usually you'll find the person says, oh, oh, you're going to be 20 minutes late? Great, that gives me time to do something else. I'll meet you there 20 minutes later. It just makes the world a better place. So, Okay. Um, any, any questions about routines, habits, or automatic yes answers? Or do you have a favorite automatic yes answer you'd like to share? <laughs> Should I lock my screen when I leave my desk? <laughs> yes. I, I got email from a coworker. Uh, this week. For, so the, the Google tradition is if you don't lock your screen, you don't get in trouble. You get victimized. You just get email sent from you to your team saying something like, I just want you to all know that I love you guys. <laughs> and then usually it's followed by email saying, hi, uh, I left my screen unlocked and that last email didn't really come from me. <laughs> Actually, we do that to management. Uh, RSA team has a good, good rep a rapport with our management, and because our management has confidential information that they have access to that is bantered and traded back and forth inside of email, we'll send an email, you know, from me to me, and we will BCC the admin team, nobody else. Um, it's not like everybody, right. but we'll BCC the admin team, and I have a folder in my mail system that's called Supervisor Nags. <laughs> and you'd be amazed. I mean, you do it four or five times. I mean, there are a couple of supervisors that just need to be dragged out and shot. But there's the vast majority of them lock their screen now when they get up because they go, oh, I didn't know you could do that the first time. Right. And it's like, okay, control, delete, <coughs> done. Sure. Or that's in the often easy category, so you could automate it by saying, you know, five minute timeout on the screen lock. Well, I, I panicked the, the division manager when I showed him how quickly I could, because we have group-wise, how quickly you could add in either the everybody can read and write email as you, right? <laughs> or you can do a control A and send every piece of email in your inbox to oh. whatever address you want, destination address. <laughs> Under two minutes, just right. click, boom, go. Oh, and he was like, <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, uh, management never, con never is concerned with security until they have a security problem in over. A way to not have that be the way they get educated is Make just <coughs> do, well, <laughs> consensually do it. You know, say, yeah. would you like me to show you? Um, okay. Yes. I have, I, I've ever kind of a funny automatic uh, yes when it should be an automatic no. <laughs> um, can we just use uh, you know, a reply to all when um, there's an attachment? Well, you sure. have attachments being circulated that are 20 megabyte PDFs. And people right. wondering why their machines and their internet are stalling and why they can't get the rest of their email. My exchange service crying. <laughs> no, we, we had that at the city and uh, there was an auto reply loop. It was a bug and um, somebody sent like a 60 meg word attachment or something. What, how big was that? 
It bounced and bounced back and forth a lot, and you know, the 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 citywide groupwise admin was very nice. He said, "Thank you for stress testing the mail system." <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it, it was it didn't come across as sarcastic at all, but I mean, that server was like it. I'm, I'm imagining 100 percent utilization, just oh, oh, God, sending yeah. it back and forth. Yeah. So another automatic. So when I'm angry, <laughs> don't click reply. Yeah. <laughs> or if you, if you click reply, change the two to yourself. Because <laughs> so you ever ever do this, say, well, I'm just going to write something, but then hit cancel. Then you go to hit cancel and hit send by mistake. Yeah. Change yeah. the two to yourself, send it to yourself. Maybe the next day you send it more. It, it, we always have to tell people use reply, you, or it, never use reply to all, just reply, always, no matter what. Always? Yes. Yeah. It, 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 in, the, in the situation I'm talking about, it's. Trust me, it's better that way. Sure. Yeah. Reply to all can be really yeah, bad. The, you know, the developer says, you know, can I have access to the live website instead of the development website? Because, you know, we're trying to debug something. And, no. You know, that's a, that's a, actually, the autom it's automatic, yes, but I have to be there. You know, let me do the typing. You, I will type whatever you tell me. Just, you know, um, I almost didn't do that uh, a couple months ago. I was like, I was in a hurry. I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, what am I doing? And then when we went to do the actual thing, it was like this massive copy that it would have totally screwed up. And like, oh my God, thank God I have this automatic sort of that automatic no answer in that situation. Should I document my code now or later? Right. <laughs> yeah, later. there is no there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. Right? So absolutely. Okay, let's talk about the cycle system. Um, the cycle system is uh, described in the book as a way of tracking your, your date book and calendar, uh, your to-do list, um, and your long-term and life goals. Um, so keeping them all in one place. Now, it takes four chapters to explain it in the book, um, so I'm not going to be able to go through all of it today. But what I can talk about is the most critical part, which is the to-do list management, which is essentially how do you remember all your user requests? We talked about using RT um, and other things, but when it comes down to it, um, your, your, whether your to-do list is how you drive your everything you do, or if it's a cache of what's in your, your request tracking uh, database, um, you're going to have a to-do list. Now, I've seen a number of different ways of maintaining a to-do list. I'd lo like to talk about some that don't work first. Um, the first one that doesn't work is the zillions of scattered notes technique. And this is a very common technique. I often see um, in cubicle farms, you see the monitor with all the yellow sticky notes around the monitor, and you're not sure, you know, is call Bob at this phone number, is this something I'm supposed to do, or am I just keeping it so I remember the phone number? Big wind comes and blows it all away, or you have your to-do list, and then you have that to-do list of notes that you took at a meeting, and you have 15 other to-do lists, and you have zillions of to-do lists, and it's a mess. And you start losing things and forgetting things. Very popular <coughs> technique, but not one that I recommend. Um, and often what happens is people in that camp uh, graduate. They say, this, this just isn't working. I have to switch. I need something better. And they buy themselves a notebook, and they say, you know, put all my to-do lists in one book, so none of this scattered notes one place, and they start um, writing them down. And it works great for the first day or two, because they're, they write things. When they do it, they cross it off. And they, they're writing new requests and crossing off things that are done. And it works great for the third day and fourth day and maybe the fourth week. By the end of the first month, you're spending as much time flipping around trying to find the one item that wasn't crossed out as, as doing requests. And it's, it's crazy. And, um, and then you start recopying things to. Well, that list, on, that page only has one thing, so I'll copy that to the end and cross it off and to tear out the sheets or what. And it's, it becomes almost as bad as the zillions of scattered notes. Um, it's just become the never-ending list of doom. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of every day, you go home tired and exhausted and thinking about this notebook you have with a million tasks, and it's, it's depressing, actually. There's no positive feedback. You, you never get a feeling of accomplishment, because you know no matter how hard you work, there's always the never-ending list of doom, and you become depressed. And hopefully then you buy my book. 
<laughs> and the book cheers you up because it says those two techniques, they're very common, but let's talk about something better. Let's talk about how to make to-do lists work. What if instead you, know, you have the zillions of lists versus the one list? How about something in the middle? How about we have 365 to-do lists per year? We have one to-do list for every day of the year. Um, we're going to keep them all in a single place, which is easy in a PDA. In a PA, that would be a book this thick, so I actually just have the next 30 to 60 sheets in my book at any time. So I have 15 on the first of the month, I load the next 30 and take out 30. Um, I'm going to keep it with me all the time, so I'm not making a little to-do list during this meeting and making a list during that meeting and then having to merge the list. And it's going to be something easy to access. Uh, the most important thing to me in a PDA is how fast it can wake up. Um, I don't like to have to wait 10 seconds before I can write something down. A PAA, um, first of all, less likely to be stolen because who wants a pile of papers? Um, but also the, the, the wake up time is very quick. I have a bookmark and I'm on the right page. It also lets me carry a pen and stuff. Um, so the cycle has all of these features. <clears throat> and um, because we have a list of uh, things that we're going to do, so my, my Monday to-do list has a bunch of things that I'm going to do. <coughs> Let me take you through like uh, a couple days of using the cycle, um, at least the to-do list part of the cycle. So you come in Monday morning, and you have uh, a bunch of items. You know you have a bunch of meetings you're going to have to attend, tasks you're going to have to do, and how many hours are there in the day? Maybe you have an eight-hour day, two hours worth of meetings, that leaves six hours. And you look at your to-do items, your tasks, and you have like 10 hours worth of work. Um, without the cycle, you just try to cram it all in, and then you kick yourself because at the end of the day, you still have work left. Well, in the cycle, you say, well, I have six hours left of work time, so I'm going to um, move four hours to the Tuesday to-do list. So you look at your list and you prioritize it and say, well, that doesn't have to be done until Wednesday. So maybe move that to the Wednesday list, move something else to the Tuesday list. And now you have a manageable chunk of work to do and you can sort of plan your day and do those things. Um, or, or at least if you, um, if you want to be a little more simple, you'd say, well, uh, yeah, I have 10 hours worth of work today, but there's two things I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do. So I'm going to do those two things and everything else is great. Um, but um, let's look at how this works. So whether you have um, the PDA looks a little different, but on paper, you can buy a stationery that looks like this. The Franklin Covey store near you sells um, these pads of um, paper with the, uh, the month and date pre-printed, um, which it's not pre-printed on this example. But So I come in and I say, well, I have two meetings today and I, I want to have lunch. So I block out those times, um, and that leaves me six hours. And maybe my most important project, I'm going to do the first thing in the day. The next project, I don't know how long it's going to take, but yeah, maybe an hour, maybe maybe five, and whatever. I'm going, to, I'm going to schedule things in the day. Personally, I don't actually write out a detailed schedule like this. I just um, you know, I mark my meetings, and then I have my to-do list. What I do with my to-do list is, um, so my to-do list looks something like this. Um, if I only have a couple things to do today, I don't do anything. I just say, okay, I'm going to do those things. But if I have more work than will fit in a day, I prioritize. I know you can't see this very well, but I've marked everything as either an A, B, or C priority. I use a very simple prioritization scheme, just A, B, C. A is things that are due today. If I, I'm going to have to stay in the building until I finish the A. Items. On a good day, I don't have any A items. B things are important things that I need to get done soon, and C is everything else. I used to have this really complicated priority scheme from 1 to 100, and I'd sit there, well, is that really a 65 or a 66? <laughs> hmm. it's, you don't need that kind of stuff. It's A, B, C. You know, today, soon, and everything else. Because um, really, I'm only concerned with what's happening today. Um, so let's say that. Um, I have these items, and I'm going to have to move at least two items to future days, um, because this is 10 hours of work and I have a six hour day. So I'm going to move these two things. On PDA, um, 
uh, if you use, say, uh, a Datebook 4, or I'm sorry, Datebook 5, great uh, software for your Palm Pilot, you can just click on this and bump it to the next day. Maybe we're going to bump this to Wednesday. So we bump this to uh, Tuesday, bump this to Wednesday. On a, on a paper system, you just copy it over to um, the appropriate day and, and mark it as moved. <clears throat> and now you have a reasonable, non-stressful amount of work that you're going to do today. You're going to do one, two, three, four items. And you can work those items, and you work them throughout the day. And your estimates are never perfect. They get better over time. But around 4.30, I look at what's left, and I say, well, how are my estimates? Am I going to be able to get everything done? Now, I used to get to like 7 o'clock, and I'd be like, wow, I've been, I'm working late. It's 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock p.m., and I was frustrated because I didn't get things done. And if I had promised something for today, <coughs> and the, the user was upset because it's past five and I hadn't gotten it done, and I'm beating myself up because uh, I hadn't gotten it done, that doesn't work. What's a better system is at around 4.30, I look at what's left, and I say, let's see. So as, I've, as I'm working, I, I mark things with an X because they're done. But it cuts to be 4.30, and I realize I'm just not going to have time for this last item. So instead of leaving the user dissatisfied by just not getting it done and working late, instead at 4.30 I can call the person and I can say, hey, I know I promised this for you today, but I didn't get it done. Um, let's negotiate. Now instead of them being surprised that it's not done, I'm being proactive, I'm talking to them, and they say, oh, well, actually, I just need it by you know, 10 tomorrow. So if I come in at 9, yeah, I can get it done. Or they say, no, I really need it done today, and then I can agree to, to work late. Um, so now I'm only working late after a negotiation. Um, I, I'm managing my time better. I'm not killing my social life. Um, so the, the cycle lets you do that. And in this case, it's really a B priority. It's not something that was due today. So I didn't even call the person. I just said, OK, I'm moving it to tomorrow. I move it to tomorrow, and maybe tomorrow is an A priority. So it's going to be the first thing I do tomorrow. And so with the never-ending list of doom, I used to leave at the end of every day worried because I still have this huge list of things to do. But now, with the cycle, at the end of the day, I say, well, I haven't finished everything. Because the system's work is never done, you never finish everything. But I know I've managed everything. I did the most important things. The things that weren't so important, I put off to tomorrow. But that's the definition of not important. They get put off to tomorrow and I'm managing my time, and I feel good because I have some accomplishments. I have an automatic journal of what I've accomplished each day, so my work, my monthly reports can get written and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I can go home happy. I can go home with a smile on my face and <coughs> leave work with a smile. So um, I know I've managed every item. I have that sort of pat on the back feeling of accomplishment because I, um, I know I've completed today's list. It's better than the zillions of notes technique because I have better control. And it's better than the list of doom because I have some kind of sense of accomplishment. So that's nutshell version of the cycle. Um, questions? I know I went really fast. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest handling projects that take a long time to finish? Excellent so. question. Um, so what if a project is 50 hours? I mean, I'm not ever going to have one day where I work 50 hours. You can break it into milestones. So for, say, in spending six months installing Legato, maybe I'm going to break that into six milestones. And I'm going to do one on, uh, actually, when I take the task, uh, I'm going to write, um, maybe on the first Monday, or on, on Monday of next six weeks, I'm going to write one milestone. And then maybe I'm going to work on it for three hours a day um, on Monday until it gets finished. <clears throat> and if I finish earlier in the week, then I have more time on, on other days. So there's different ways of, of breaking things down um, for, for large projects. It also lets you sort of pace yourself. When your boss comes and you say, are you done? You can say, well, I'm, 
I'm on milestone three of six milestones, and you sound like a genius instead of just saying, well, I'm uh, not done yet. Um, so, wow, he's managing his time so well. He's on milestone three of six. That's sort of like being 50% done. Um, yes? Um, how do you deal with people who are insistent on using the never ending list of doom, especially like when they're your immediate supervisor? You know, you can only fix your own problems. <laughs> True. You can, um, uh, you, the, you can watch a, a videotape of uh, an earlier version of this presentation on Google Video. Maybe they'll watch that uh, and we'll convince them. Uh, but really, like, you can't change them, but you can, you can manage yourself. Um, <coughs> you change how you react to them. So you, A, accept that they're going to be screwed up in their time management. Um, so once you've accepted that, you can say, well, I'm going to be good about my time management and other techniques. I mean, the book talks a little about this. You can start to manage their time. Um, you can, um, if someone has really bad time management, then one technique you can use is go into their office and say to yourself, I'm going to stand here until they finish that thing that's, that they need to do that's delaying me. Um, so if you ever have a user that stands in your office until you finish something, maybe, maybe that's saying, saying something. Um, so there's different things you can do. Okay. Good question. Who here is sitting there saying, hmm, Tom, that sounds great, but what kind of fantasy land do you live in where at the beginning of the day you know everything that's going to be done and you can plan your day like that? That's not reality, we have the you know, number one problem with system is constant interrupts. So what do we do when new tasks come during the day? Um, show them their list, show them your list and tell them they're not on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, we have the without being a jerk clause. <laughs> so record, delegate, do. Um, so we record it. Um, and if it's urgent, maybe, if it's not urgent, maybe it gets recorded in tomorrow's to-do list. Or maybe they say, you know, by next Thursday, I need such and such done. And you know, so um, what I do for that kind of thing is I put it on um, today or tomorrow's to-do list, usually tomorrow's, and I try to do a little bit, because often, you know, oh, that's easy, that'll take an hour. If it's due Thursday, I can do it Wednesday, no problem. But Wednesday comes and you realize you don't have the right cable. And the whole thing goes to hell. So um, I try to at least do any kind of prep work early. And then if I do need to order a cable, it can be ordered. It can come on Wednesday and, and be done for Thursday, that kind of thing. Um, if my boss has told me, oh, you know, if I've complained to my boss, oh, I'm getting interrupted too much, sometimes a manager will say, well, that's why we hired you. You should be spending half of your time dealing with interrupts. OK. <coughs> I work an eight-hour day. I'm going to put a task on my to-do list every day. Four hours of interest. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to be broken up. But now when I'm allocating how much work I can do today, I'm not allocating eight hours of work. I'm allocating four hours of to-do lists and four hours of interrupts. If I have less than four hours of interrupts, awesome. I get more project work done today. Um, so I can schedule a task of n hours of interrupts. Um, we delegate, record, do when possible, and then reprioritize as needed. So if someone comes to you, um, you can you can do that task today and sort of reprioritize the items. This also gives you the ability to better manage emergencies. So you, someone comes to you, uh, or actually, so a server dies, and you know you're just going to be spending the rest of the day bringing it back up. You know, a disk has died, you're going to have to restore the data from tape. Wrecks your entire day. And then the next day you realize because of that outage, you forgot to do something really important, like empty the water from the chiller and not get <laughs> off. So instead you'd say, yes, there's an emergency. Let me check my to-do list. Or you can, you can start dealing with the emergency. Once the tape is reading the data you know, to the replacement disk, you can look at your to-do list and say, oh, better, better empty the water. Or you can at least turn to your boss and say, Absolutely, boss, I will spend the rest of my life fixing this server until it's back up. But you should know, this was the day I promised Bob I'd install the new version of GCC. And your boss can say, I'll talk to Bob. And now you're working more as a team. You're working on fixing the server. Your boss can, 
can uh, manage expectations with projects that are being delayed. So just having a written list has all these knock-on effects that can really help you just better manage you know, emergencies and you know, things like that. Other questions? Would you suggest that, you know, for the for the single sysadmin that, you know, he, you know, send out or, you know, arrange with the entire company that, hey, listen, guys, for, you know, from 8 to 10 in the morning, I'll handle all of your issues. I just need, you know, a certain block of time to do my things. Sure. You know? um, yeah, uh, a great thing is you get get your boss to have a policy. From, from 8 to 10, uh, you're, you're dealing with interrupts or you know the, the day's emergencies, the things that came in overnight. From 10 to 1 or 2 is project time, and then at the end of the day is more interrupts. And get permission to put a sign up on your office that says, you know, I'm sorry, don't, your name is Mike. Mike. Mike's schedule, 8 to 10. I love you. I do whatever you tell me to. You know, 10 to 2 projects, whatever. And that way, when someone comes to you at 1 o'clock, you can say, you know, I'm in project time right now, but I'm creating a ticket. Create the ticket right in front of them so they have an acknowledgement and say, but, you know, I'll get to it. Unless it's, you know, the fax machine is on fire, and then that's on the, you know, the do item. You know, it's an emergency. Um, but that way, man you've let management communicate the schedule, which is good. Um, and then when they forget and they come to you, you have, you have something to point to um, as a reminder. Um, another useful thing is if your management can have a written policy of what's urgent, often people say, you know, well, I can't tell my users no because they say everything is urgent. Get management to write a definition of urgent so that you can say, you know, hey, I know that sounds really important and it is important. You know, my boss says I need to follow this, so you're blaming your <coughs> boss and letting them say no by saying, well, you know, my boss has this policy, I have to, I have to do that later because in the midday I'm supposed to be working on projects. So what constitutes an emergency? On a newspaper, it might be anything that would prevent us from getting tomorrow's issue out on time. And that is so liberating as a system and to know that because before you have a definition like that, Everything can be an emergency. It's very stressful. But now you know, you know, oh, I can't, you know, play Quake. You know, you can say, no, that's not an emergency. But, oh, the system that feeds the printing press is down. Oh, that's an emergency. I can go do that with confidence. And you won't get in trouble for having other projects not done because you followed their definition of emergency. And everyone has some kind of definition. You know, is it uh, at Google? You know, we everyone knows what the emergency is. It, it's related to um, basically search and advertisements. If either anything to do with those, um, you know, Gmail can you know, is is important. But if if you have to choose between saving you know the baby from the burning building advertising system or Gmail, you know, it's um, it's the advertising <laughs> system. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have a department that deals with babies, and <laughs> that really shouldn't be my job. So actually, what um, I'm not sure what kind of industry or industries people here are are in, but what constitutes an emergency in your, or what should like what's the equivalent to the newspaper won't come out on time? Uh, for you? Well, when I do it, it's generally legal or medical. So if it has to do with not being able to pull up patient records or not being able to. Sue someone. Excellent. Okay. That's an emergency. Yes. Uh, transcripts uh, for education, uh, financial aid. Oh, okay. Financial aid. Yes. Um, HP, Autodesk, Microsoft reseller. So the no okay. So the <coughs> workflow involved in you know in selling things and yeah. producing, it, delivering on what you've sold. Yeah. So so keeping workstations not only not just the service but keeping the workstations up in order as well as the content manager, otherwise people can't properly generate quotes and sell. Right. So if someone says, I really need a software upgrade, you can, and someone else is saying, I can't generate a quote, now you know, you know, well, I'm going to help you generate the quote, and the new software release is something that you can do without for a day. Or whatever. Well, I would say software would probably say no, because we have software that 
if you, if you do an upgrade, it will screw up how it submits, how everyone else submits information to the SQL server. Right. You know, a, another thing is um, new ser differentiating new service from current service. So if someone comes to you and says, um, would it be possible for you to, you know, empty the waste baskets? You can say, well, you know, that's, that's not in this written scope of work of what we do. And so that's, that's, that's really a new thing. And my boss is in charge of deciding if we do new services. Could you talk to him? Or I'll go with you and talk to him, because I'd love to take that task on. But um, yeah. it's really, you know, my boss hates when I, when I take on new tasks, you know, new categories of tasks. There's right. a hand in the back. Uh, I support uh, HR and financial for government employees. Mm -hmm. And thank God, because, yeah, that's yeah. what, whenever I meet someone from our payroll group, I'm always like, anything I can do to help? <laughs> right, absolutely. So um, if you can get that in writing, so um, actually I talk about documentation in a bit, but um, if you think about, you know, what needs to be on your department's um, web page should be like how to get help, like hours of operation, what you send email to or call, scope, what we do and what we don't do. You know, we don't empty the waste baskets, that's another group. We, you know, whatever, and what constitutes an emergency. Um, those three things are not just communication, that's your boss providing you tools so that you have permission to say no, and you have permission to manage your time, and you have permission to prioritize. So if you don't have those three documents on a web page somewhere that users can access and you can print out and put on your wall, then that's what you need to do Monday morning, is tell your boss you want those three things in writing. And believe me, it's not something they're going to do in an afternoon, because the political drama of getting people to find, you know, well, you know, is, is this really, well, if payroll doesn't print, you know, the newspaper, you know, how long can we go without paying reporters before the newspaper doesn't get printed, right? Isn't everything important? You know, it, forces, it forces them to think, and that's really scary, so it takes a while. Um, we talked a little about uh, if you have too many tasks, you can move some to the next day. But what if you have just a million tasks? You can't every day move them to the next day. So some things you can do is you can move items to the next month. Um, you can um, move items into RT. When, I, my, when my to-do list is really big, I take the low priority items and I just file tickets if there isn't a ticket for them already, I just file tickets for them and say, you know, yes, someday we'd like to, you know, upgrade this firewall software. And I just create a ticket and take it off my to-do list so I don't have to worry about it every day. I know it's recorded, it's not going to be lost. And if a miracle happens, a coworker will take that ticket. Um, or, you know, if your boss reviews the incomplete tickets and says, you know, oh, that's really urgent, then you know it's really urgent because he'll, he'll love you that. Um, and then also, you can show a list to your manager to be triage. So, you know, triage is when you come into an emergency room, there's someone triaging the patients. You know, bleeding patients are more important than headaches. not headaches, and they have a scheme for that. And when I'm totally overloaded, this happens maybe once a year um, that it gets so bad that I show, that this is sort of an extreme thing, you show your boss, your boss is like you to count how many ceiling tiles we have, and you say, great, let me show you what I have on my plate, and this is why I haven't had time to count the, the ceiling tiles. If you don't have a written to-do list, you can't do this at all, but if you have any kind of recorded to-do list, you can say, this is what I have, help me prioritize, boss, because bosses often feel that they have no control, they, you know, why won't anyone, you know, do the priorities that I try to set out. And if you show them your, your to-do list, and like, oh, I'm getting an opportunity to directly prioritize. This is what I've always wanted. And they can look at your to-do list. And I've usually had a couple different reactions. One was, John asks you to do that kind of thing? Oh, no, no, we're not supposed to do that. I'll talk to John. Or you tell John no, and you can cross that off. Or, oh, is that what the hell you do all day? I have no idea you spend three hours a day on this. And now they have a better understanding of what you do, and they can reprioritize. Or uh, the best thing is when I've had bosses look at my to-do list and say, 
oh, now I understand why we've had this disconnect. Let me put it this way. These three things is what I want you to, uh, these three things are what I want you to focus on. Everything else is low priority. And you look at your to-do list and you, you see, oh, those categories, great. They're now my A and B and everything else is a C. Um, <coughs> and it, it, it can actually help you develop a better relationship with your boss. Um, but you don't want to do it more than once or twice a year because then they think you can't manage your time. But, and they'll say, why don't you buy Tom's book? <laughs> so some tips for if you have way too many tasks. And uh, Jim earlier asked, what about big projects? You can break it into milestones or chunks. Um, schedule one chunk per day or per week. Um, I like the one milestone each Monday thing because that way, you know, I can sort of feel like, oh, this is the week I'm gonna, you know, my legato example. You know, this is the week I'm gonna get the, the tape changer plugged in, rack mounted, and through the tests. You know, just that one little bite of, uh, of the project. And if you start that on Monday and get it done, on Thursday you feel like, woo, you know, accomplishment of the week. It's like Friday becomes this bonus day. <coughs> so number eight, document the procedures you want. So we talked before about, um, I think my example was the, the RAID system, where changing a broken disk on the RAID system was really difficult, so we documented it. Um, I'd like to propose that the secret to documenting procedures is to document the procedures you hate. From a time management perspective, document the things that you don't like to do. So um, one thing I don't like to do is, well, every time I create a new user's account, there's like 15 things I have to do. And even though I've automated most of it, you can't automate things like visit the user and see if everything's okay. So, um, or you know, create an account on that one system you haven't been able to automate. So I have all these checklists on my my wiki page. Um, how many people are familiar with wikis? Like wiki, Wikipedia. It's basically a website that's very easy to update because um, you can say everyone or certain people can can update pages and it gives you a little editor experience. Um, so I, I'm big on checklists. So my new user uh, has a checklist. So instead of getting trouble, getting in trouble for always forgetting one particular item, I have a checklist. Every time there's a new user, I print out that page and I have a checklist of items until it's done. Um, or I put them in my to-do list. Um, actually, when I'm managing people, I force them to print out the page and cross out things when they're done. Because for a jun junior admins often get distracted and now I can say, you know, when you, the last thing on the checklist is give this checklist to, to your boss, to me, and then I know that they're really done, and I can say, oh, well, you forgot to check off this one. You know. uh, account termination procedures, that's important to document just because it ha hopefully happens so rarely that um, it's good to have a checklist so you don't forget to collect the person's pager or VPN card key or something like that. Oh, wow. Or laptop. <laughs> I wish they'd forget to collect my laptop when I lost when I left my laptop. Um, setting up new workstations is another good checklist opportunity. Um, any kind of prone and frequent procedure, like replacing a hard disk on the RAID system, um, and any procedure you dislike doing. So I don't really like fixing the RAID system, but I've documented it. So now, if I have a junior admin, the next time it breaks. And he says, Tom, the RAID system's dead. I say, oh, well, read that wiki page, and if you have any problems, you can come to me for questions. So now it helps me delegate, because I can you know, delegate to, uh, you know, delegate items to the a junior system. Um, so a list like that becomes a list of things I can delegate to junior system in. It also, if I don't have a junior system in, or if I'm a solo system in, becomes the basis of the job description I'm going to write if my boss ever gives me permission to hire someone. So when my boss says, hey, we finally have permission to hire someone, we've grown so much, we want to get a second system administrator, what should they do? Usually the boss will say, let's get someone who's just like you so that we have two of you. You can look like a genius by saying, actually, let's hire a junior person. And I have this wiki page that has this table of contents, this list of all the things that the junior person could do. And if you click on any of these items, it tells them how to do it. 
So the list becomes the job description. If you click on each link, you can collect the skills involved, and that becomes the, uh, the skill set section of the job description, practically writes itself. Um, and now, uh, if you get that person hired, um, you have the ultimate time management tool, which is getting someone else to do your work. And you can focus on the, the exciting new projects that you want to do. And you think, oh man, Tom's being so mean, having all this craft work given to the junior person. Actually, for a junior person, it's really exciting to get these kind of responsibilities and, and opportunities to learn. And you mentor them, and eventually they do become a senior system. And this is how we build skills in our group and the level of skills in our community. <coughs> so um, it all plays into yourself. And um, you know, this is also, I'm a sort of forgetful person, so I have to write things down. I've been in a situation where someone says, yeah, we can hire a second assistant. What should they do? And I can't remember all the things that I wish you know, I was able to remember. But now I, I have this list. Um, so that's my documentation thing. So I really look at, you know, documentation used to be this scary thing for me, but now I look at it as a time management tool. And I don't try to document everything in the world. I just document things that I'm very actually uh, selfish about. I document things that would help me uh, do a better job or help me delegate. Any questions or comments about wikis? How many people have a wiki in their work environment? Okay, a couple people. Um, I recommend, um, there's a couple different ones. Twiki is uh, a wiki product, it's open source. It's fairly easy to install and set up and has a lot of nice plugins and stuff. There's fancier ones, there's Social Text, which is a commercial product, and there's uh, MediaWiki, which is really great but a little difficult to install. Wikipedia doesn't require a database or anything, you just get up and running very quickly on any machine with Apache and Pro. <coughs> so the last section, um, don't squander the good stuff. Um, so at the opening of this talk, I talked about how um, if you can find eight one-hour tips um, in this presentation or, or the book, that's an extra two and a half months of work, well, work days worth of months. Um, so don't squander the good stuff. What are you going to do with all this free time? What are you going to do with all this free time? It would be awesome. I mean, your boss hopes that you're going to you know, continue working 70 hours a week. You're just going to do a lot more during the 70 hours a week. But I have this simple proposal. I think that system administrators need to reclaim the 40-hour work. I think uh, if you use the book's techniques to be a, a better 70-hour better a week employee, that's great. But consider uh, using the techniques to get as much or more work done, but only be there for 40 hours a week. Um, we've, I have too many friends who are workaholics. I have too many friends whose kids are growing up without knowing their father or mother because they're, they're always at work. So um, what do you can do with all this free time? I highly recommend you start using it to you know, set a time limit. Say, you know, I, my goal is to use these techniques to leave work at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock every day to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to make a routine being, um, you know, every Saturday's to-do list is going to say, you know, play catch with my son or do something, um, you know, go to the zoo, go to the science museum, uh, spend time with your family, rebuild those connections. And if you have time left over, and if, or if you don't have a family, use that time to be involved in your community. There are so many organizations out there that, um, you know, homeless shelter that would love for a person to stop by once a week and back up their systems, clean out their viruses, maybe answer a couple questions about, you know, how they could use, you know, their tools a little bit better. Often they're using Microsoft Excel to maintain mailing lists, and you could just, you know, write a macro for them that would help them dramatically. It's amazing how much help a simple macro. I mean, I don't, I learned, I can write like one simple kind of macro in Excel. That's all I can do. But you can really help, you can really go a long way if you're helping someone without a lot of, um, without a lot of technology experience. Um, run for political office. Being on the school board can make such a big difference. And it's usually only a two or three hour commitment per month, which is nothing. And if we did that more, then 
you know, maybe the geek things in schools would get my, more priority than the football team. You know, the chess club should get more, well, not more funding than the football team, but, you know, a non-zero amount would be nice. Um, and think about how much, how many times you've heard of a town council doing something that you say, oh, they're so stupid, they obviously don't know anything about, you know, technology or a copyright law is put into place, and you're like, oh, they're obviously not sysadmins, everyone would work around that so easily. Well, maybe sysadmins need to take a bigger political role. And if we, you know, there's right now only one senator that's a, a, a doctor, and they're making all these medical laws. Well, there's zero senators that are sysadmins, and they're making technology laws. So get involved in your community. Um, get involved with, I'm wearing a t-shirt from LOPSA, which is the League of Professional System Administrators. Turn around. Oh. Good quote. Um, so the goal of LOPSA is to um, increase the professionalism of system administrators. Um, if you think about where doctors were 150 years ago, 150 years ago, the barber in your town was the doctor. They would, you know, do, uh, you know, they had the knives and stuff, so they would do, you know, leeches and bloodletting. And then someone said, hey, we need, medical profession is important. We should be, um, uh, we, there should be official training that all doctors should go through. There should be ethical practices and standards. And, and in 150 years, turn the medical profession into the side business of, that barbers did, into a respected profession that helps people. System administrators are the doctors of the computer world. And right now, we are very much the barbers that use leeches and do bloodletting as a side job. Um, um, just a little bit of effort can go a long way. Um, if you're not a LOPSA member, I highly recommend it. SAGE is also an excellent group. I'm involved with both. Um, uh, they both work on increasing the professionalism of our, uh, of our profession. And uh, who knows? You know, we start now, and 100 years from now, we'll, we'll be the you know, well-respected doctors of, of our industry, as we should be. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And um, uh, we have uh, time for questions. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Give you a couple questions. Any anything at all? Any topics? Because he actually knows quite a bit beyond time management. He actually does stuff, not just tells people how to manage their time. <laughs> what do you do at Google? What? what do you do at Google? What do I do at Google? Nothing Excellent. yet. <laughs> um, I'm in the team that keeps www.google.com up. <laughs> About 200 people. What's um, the, what's the from from capacity planning to. Uh, you know, live monitoring stuff. So all the different um, services. I actually focus in the part that deals with um, crawling the web. Um, so when you get Googlebot hitting your your web server and indexing all your pages, that's that's my team. Um, when it stops indexing, we get paged. What's the? I forget the title. It's a really interesting title. Oh, site reliability. There engineer. you go. There you go. The, the SRE group is the. Uh, the group at Google that deals with sort of the top gun group that um, you know, gets what we want because usually we're asking for it because searches aren't happening. Mm -hmm. Second most important part of Google is the search quality group. Yes. What does do no evil mean to you? What does do no evil mean to me? That's an excellent question. It means that um, when I go to bring up an ethical issue, I always seem to learn that management is already having a very deep and thorough discussion about it, and which is just so wonderful compared to other places where I've worked. Um, it means that our CEO, not only publicly, but you know, privately in meetings, says things like, let's not talk about making money right now. What would make the best you know, search quality for users right now? Um, and and we'll, we're going to do that and then figure out how to make money given that we have to have the best sort of quality on the internet. Yeah. That but, was yeah, the, the whole thing about uh, having a Chinese website was so gut wrenchingly difficult for these guys. I mean, one of our founders grew up in Soviet Russia, 
um, where you know before the wall came down, um, where censorship is so common, the KGB, and actually he came to America because of a trade bill that was signed in Congress that let his family come over. And so when, when he says things like, I believe trade improves human rights, he's not talking theoretically. He's, he really means it. His father was able to get a, a work visa, and that, that's what brought him to this country. Um, so he takes that kind of thing very seriously. So um, I think it's going to be very powerful um, when you know, a young child in China signs, you know, does a search on Tiananmen Square because he wants to go on vacation there. It's a common vacation destination. And if he searches on Yahoo, it's just going to show you know, the censored results that China wants. But if he searches on Google, it's going to show those results. And at the bottom, it's going to say, it does say, your government has requested that we remove certain things. And he's going to ask, why, why is that message there? And I think that's going to be just profoundly um, important in the next 15 years. Yes? What's your view on the whole Department of Justice uh, rulings, you know, at the, 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 the DOJ wanting all that information from Google on their search logs? I, oh, I have to say, I am not a Google spokesperson. <laughs> These are not official. <laughs> what, what do I think about us? Yeah, yeah. From what I was reading earlier, um, the, you know, the, you know, the judge ruled that they don't have to, but they encourage Google to, Google to at least give some the, information. The, the judge hasn't ruled. The judge has said that that's the direction he's thinking about. He, I, okay. I, he did actually. He did. Oh, so obviously I'm unqualified to answer this question because I don't know what's <laughs> happened recently. Um, but I'm hoping for the best. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do you think the Department of Justice? <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you the coolest technology I've found in recent time. This is the TV Be Gone. TV Be Gone. Um, oh yeah. You press the button, and it starts playing the remote control code for for off for all the popular TVs. Oh nice. Models. Yeah. So when you're in you know a, a bar and the TV's so loud that you can't hear anything, they won't turn it down. This sort of solves the problem. <laughs> Where did you get that? Um, TVBeGone.com. <laughs> I've seen that. Cool. What? I thought TVCarries. And Think Geek carries it. They're now available in, in different colors. So you know, I have the green, girlfriend has the purple. Turn it off, my camera keeps going off. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have to tell you that I, I giggled at the, you know, what does do no evil mean to you? Because I've, had to, I've heard that question asked. Uh, a whole line of Google employees uh, at the last Lisa mm -hmm. um, and at several other conferences. This is something that's very important, and I think that's indicative of um, just sysadmins as a whole. Uh, we, as a whole, have a very strict moral conduct. Even though there are a few turds that work in our industry, uh, sysadmins as a whole. I mean, our job is entirely about trust. So just think about that when you have a job and you go to do something, even if it may be, you know, that's the company policy, uh, think of, you have to think a lot about, you know, is that right? right. Not just, is it right for me because I'm going to make money doing it? Yeah. Actually, another way of answering that question is, um, at other companies where I've said, hey, we have an ethical issue, and I know it's going to be an uphill battle, because, but, you know, often, you know, ethical issues are just, management just never thought of that. And you bring it up to them and they say, you know, at other companies that I've worked at, they said, oh, we never thought of that. Now that we've thought of that, get out of here. You know? um, <laughs> and at Google, they usually have thought of it, and if they haven't, they say, wow, we really have to think about that, and we have to do the right thing. And that's, it's so amazing to think, when I find an ethical issue, it's not going to be an uphill battle, it's going to be a dialogue, and we're going to have a resolution. So, yes. so what do you do when you, when you cross that fork on the road, when you have identified a some sort of an ethical issue, but uh, you're, you know, the unpopular vote and the how to deal with it. Well, um, I mean, everything ultimately is, you know, every decision the company makes ultimately is the CEO's decision. Um, but uh, it's a lot better to have been heard than to have not been allowed to speak. What were you saying? Um, so, so I was actually going to go into say one more thing about Google in general, which is that Google is really hungry for good systems. Yeah. 
So if you or you know someone who's willing to move to the South Bay area, um, go or New York, York or Dublin, or, New York, or, or Dublin, Minnesota. Ireland, or Santa Monica, <laughs> or Brooklyn, Washington, <laughs> um, go look go look on Google's <laughs> website. You'll see the about. And you'll find the job section and, and look around because there's uh, Google's hiring, and um, you should you should you should think about. It. Yes, and it's such an awesome place to work. <laughs> what about mediocre access program? They, they have amazing <laughs> infrastructure, and you get to do with, deal with problems that are exciting and useful, and you see the results. You know, you know, you're actually helping people, and um, and there's free food. And there's the food. gourmet cafeteria. <laughs> we'll have eight free food. Free yeah. food, free so lunch, and <laughs> three squares a day. Food. Three <laughs> One of our cafeterias does breakfast. Um, they all do lunch, and two, two of them do dinner yeah. also. Oh, wow. So um, plus, yeah, three squares a day. Plus just like jail. Plus they're all over the place to have like bulk yeah. foods and well, soda and all kinds and of stuff. And I and I do work forty hours a week um, because <laughs> you know because they do do the infrastructure things. So that you know, everything isn't an emergency, we, um, we can do that. The, my group, the Assist Site Reliability Engineering, our slogan is, is um, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> is that handy back? Yeah, you're lecturing to an open source group. I was just wondering what's Google's policy on the use of open source software. Um, I can give you a short answer. The best answer is that Chris DeBona is on full was hired by Google to be our open source sort of ambassador to um, make sure that we are um, helping the open source community visibly and tangibly and then in, inside the company he's sort of like the policeman that makes sure that we're doing things the right way um, that we're, we're following policies that we're involved in the community so we're big believers in open source um, you know I don't know what technologies we've Publicly said we use, but uh, well, just name an open source technology, and we're probably using it. Um, and the fact that uh, we do, you know, all, if you notice, all of our products work really well on Firefox, and we have fire, a lot of the Firefox people work for Google. Um, uh, we really, um, you know, I, I think that alone helps the open source movement so much. Um, well, I was going to mention the IAM initiative right now. All the IM work that you do. Oh yeah, we're, we have this initiative to for federated instant messaging, so that um, we want you to be able to chat with everyone on any service. I think that's the. Yes. In your job and a lot of the jobs with people you work with, how important is a, is a pi, uh, skills of Python? Oh, how important is Python? Yes. In my job? Yeah. So our. Any, any code that deals with production is in C++ or Python. So as a Perl junkie, um, I'm slowly learning Python, but um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be ready. So sure, it really depends on what you're doing, but you will be better off with it than without it, and you will almost certainly be required to learn. Yeah. We'll, we'll interview you and do all Perl questions, and then the last one is, you know, <coughs> how well do you think you'll You'll transfer this knowledge to my Python. <laughs> but it begins with P. It's one of the lamp. You know, Just another program. <laughs> and um, feel free to email me directly about um, jobs <coughs> at Google. Um, I have a little FAQ that I email to people that, like, some I person group that says, like, um, which I do. Which, um, I'll, I'll give out slide. whichever one you want, but I have yeah. to now. Um, give out the Google address. Oh, okay. I, have, uh, I think... The, oh, oh, I don't have your Google one. I have your Gmail one. <laughs> that cracks me up. Oh, that works too. <laughs> it's yes, that Tom at gmail.com. <laughs> Actually, let me give out... Just, uh, well, just well, here, send me an email. Sure. Sorry. Sure. Uh, just, just, just put it on all the porn 
Oh, you mean the porn site? Oh, okay. You need another address for that. <laughs> yeah, um, as far as me being on a porn site, I'm usually hard for my brain. It's not my good luck. <laughs> yeah, everythingsystem.com, which is a little bit of a hyperbole. <laughs> well, thank you very much.